Well, tonight we're going to be discussing, tonight uh, we're going to be discussing leadership styles and contrasting Christian theology. We're going to discuss leadership styles and contrasting Christian theology. Uh, on page 65 of your book, you'll see this, um, this header that says leadership styles. And the first two that we're going to talk about are the most obvious ones that are in play today in, in the marketplace in which we live, in the churches that we worship in. And these two leadership styles are called hierarchical and Arthurian. Hierarchical and Arthurian. Now, I think we have those coming up there. We do. Hierarchical and Arthurian. The first one, uh, hierarchical, may be uh, a bit familiar uh, to you. Uh, that is the kind of leadership style that has a, a, a top-down or bottom-up reality. Meaning, you start at the bottom rung of the ladder, and you work your way up to the top, and then if you're on the top, all the people beneath you are there to support you and make your world great, not the other way around. You understand? Hierarchical. That's the corporate structure of America. That's how most people understand their world to be. The only problem with a hierarchical uh, way of thinking is it's completely counter-scriptural. It is not remotely the way Jesus instructs us to live. So the corporate way of thinking often gets transferred to churchdom. It gets transferred into the church world in which we live, and, and we start living our life in a hierarchical mindset. Why? Because that is the lower nature, depraved nature way to think, where everyone's got to start at the bottom, and they work their way to the top. Right? Hierarchical. Well, what in the world is Arthurian? Uh, I want to show you a little clip to give you a little taste of what Arthurian leadership looks like. Watch this with me. If you must die, die serving something greater than yourself. Better still, live and serve. The round table. Yes. Yeah. This is where the High Council of Camelot meets. No head, no foot. Everyone equal. Even the king. In serving each other, we become free. That is the very heart of Camelot. Not these stones, timbers, towers, palaces. Burn them all. And Camelot lives on. Because it lives in us. It's a belief we hold in our hearts. Do you get it? You see... Arthurian philosophy is the theology that Jesus espoused when he came to build the church. Jesus came to build the church with an Arthurian mentality. Now, here's the irony. All the King Arthur Camelot lore was taken directly from the Synoptic Gospels. 10th century, uh, all, all of the uh, writings that happened in the 10th century uh, glamorizing and sensationalizing uh, uh, Arthur legend completely was allegorically taken from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how Jesus established the church, how he sent them out two by two, he brought them back, he empowered them to actually lead, right? And that's how Jesus established the church. So we don't take a concept from the Arthurian lore. The Arthurian lore was taken from the scripture. And what we want to do is we want to really establish within our people, within our own hearts, an Arthurian model of leadership. Now, uh, there's a continuum. There's a continuum that, that exists within uh, any kind of leader. And, and that continuum is going to be based upon your centeredness, your centeredness. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start uh, com contrasting and comparing five categories, core characteristics of both the styles, uh, what those styles promote, what they result in, how they view people, and the phraseology. So let's start with the core characteristics, shall we? Here's the first one. Number one. 
If you are going to be a hierarchical leader, you are going to be self-centered. If you're going to be an Arthurian leader, you're going to be Christ-centered. Do you know that there are only two centers in the universe, not three? Just two. We are either going to find ourselves being Christ-centered, which will influence and impact the way we view the world in which we lead, or we are going to be self-centered, which will impact and view the world and the way in which we lead. It will affect the, the lenses of how we see life and how we interact in this thing called life. We are either going to be Christ-centered or self-centered. That's a core characteristic. Number two, if you're going to be a hierarchical leader, you're going to be having and possessing an upwardly mobile mindset. That's not foreign, is it? Having an upwardly mobile mindset is common. Isn't that the great American dream? I mean, to be better than your parents, to, to, to start your way at the bottom and work your way up to the top and have an upwardly mobile mindset? Well, here's the challenge. In a, an Arthurian leadership style, we're going to have an outwardly mobile mindset. We're not going to reach up. Now, follow me. We're not going to reach up. We're going to reach out. See, an Arthurian leader has a centeredness about them that causes them to not get their identity tied and tethered to what they can amass. It's tied and tethered to their assignment and mission. So you're going to reach out rather than reach up. If you're going to be a hierarchical leader, you're going to be very insecure. Is there anything worse than being around insecure people? I mean, bless you, Jesus. There's nothing worse than being around insecure. People that are insecure are always wanting to get taller on the shoulders of someone else. Right? They're, they're not feeling adequate about themselves, so they'll put someone else down so that they can feel up. They'll always be threatened by the success of other people. They'll always uh, take a shot at someone who's trying to, maybe if they have a great hair day and they look beautiful with the clothes that they wear today. Right? And if, you're a, if you see someone dressed nice and you're like, oh, gosh, they maybe should go on Jenny Craig before they try pulling that thing off because that doesn't look good on them at all. I mean, if they were a little more slender, maybe they could make that thing look nice. But man, you see, they'll take a shot at someone to make them look small so they look tall. And you know what that is? It's an evidence of a hierarchical mindset. That insecurity is not the issue. It's a symptom of the issue of their core, of their centeredness. If you are an Athurian leader, you're not going to be insecure. You're going to be confident. You're going to be confident. There's going to be a confidence that lives in you that is not going to be derived from what you achieve and what you amass, where you live, what you drive, what you wear. You're going to have confidence that is sovereignly from the Lord because of your Christ-centeredness. Does that make sense? Because out of, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the, the heart, the mouth speaks. How many of you are middle of the tube toothpaste squeezers? Ooh, you drive me crazy! Start at the bottom and work your way up! But you know what? No, no matter where you squeeze the toothpaste, do you know what you're going to get when you squeeze that tube of toothpaste? Toothpaste. You are not going to get peanut butter and jelly. Uh-uh. No, no, no. You're not going to get ketchup. No, no, no. When you squeeze it, what's in it comes out of it. And Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why when you get squeezed, you want to find out what's really inside of you? Get squeezed and you'll find out what's really inside of you. You want to know how centered you are and what your centered is? Is it hierarchical? Is it Arthurian? If you are a hierarchical leader, you know what you are? You're a speaker. If you're an Arthurian leader, you know what you are? You're a listener. You're a listener. Because hierarchical leaders just want to talk, 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 making happy talk, talk about things we like to do. Hierarchical leaders only just want to always talk. Arthurian leaders want to listen first. In James chapter 1, write this down in the margin. In James chapter 1, Jesus' brother said this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Hurry up and listen. Slow to talk. Right? Now, I love the verse that we have here that's printed. In Hebrews 13, 6, it says, So I say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? 
Would you take uh, your writing utensil and would you just circle and underline that word confidence? That word confidence. Here's why. Because uh, in, this, in this thing called confidence and this thing called centers, uh, we, we've already identified that there are going to be two centers. We are either going to be self-centered or we are going to be Christ-centered. You know, I don't know what it is about uh, Christmas when people go marry Xmas, when they X out Christ. That just bugs the bejeebers out of me. It just, just rubs the fur on my back the wrong way. Well, here's the continuum that we live with, okay? And I want, on, on the other side, on page 64, there's a blank side. I left it that way on purpose so you could write this down. We have a continuum of A through Z, and A is going to represent arrogance. Z is going to re, uh, represent insecurity. And M in the fulcrum, right, M is going to represent confidence. Now, based on your temperament and based on how God has wired you, you're, you're going to be prone to list to one side or the other, aren't you? And based on your centeredness, you're going to list in your leadership style to one side or the other. Now, really, uh, arrogance is symptomatic of a self of a self-centeredness. Insecurity, insecurity is a symptom of a self-centeredness. But confidence that is not arrogant is going to be represent of a Christ-centeredness. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. J-K-L-M-N-O-P. J-K-L-M-N-O-P. Make a rectangle. No one is going to be perfectly M when it comes to confidence. But what we should strive to do and how we portray godly confidence is be somewhere in that rectangle. If we, listen, take an inventory of your own heart. If you hear yourself talking about you all the time, it's going to reveal to you that there's probably an arrogance that's living inside of you, which, by the way, arrogance isn't the issue. It's symptomatic of the issue, which is your centeredness. If you, if you feel yourself being jealous or, 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 or you, you, you see yourself belittling other people so you feel better about you, that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is indicative of your centeredness. Listen, if you hear other people leaning toward arrogance or leaning toward insecurity, it's only indicting the centeredness. Now, Watch this with me, because this is really cool. Uh, we have targets up here on the board. Can everybody see this okay, by the way? Kinda? Thumbs up if you can see it okay. Like that if it's so-so. Down if you can at all. Okay. So here's what I want you to, what I want you to really catch. Uh, this bullseye, okay? Christ-centered. This bullseye, self-centered. If we have a Christ-centeredness, we walk with a confidence that's not a swagger. It doesn't stink like an arrogant peacock. It, it, it's not something that, that, that makes you feel like, oh, come on, just get a life and quit being so insecure with yourself. If we walk in Christ-centeredness, there's a confidence there, right? Now, if Christ is our center, watch this with me. If Christ was our, is our center, here's what gets uh, birthed out of this at the next, at the nine pointer. The nine pointer is going to be something called assignment. Every single person from God has an assignment that they're supposed to do. Did you know that? If you know why you're here on earth drawing breath, do you know what kind of leader you're going to become? 
You're going to become such a sought-after leader. People are going to want to be around you. You're not going to be lonely. You'll have a plethora of friends. You're going to have to, wi- you're going to, have to discipline yourself with who you spend your time with because there's going to be a fragrance that is desirable about you because any person that walks in their assignment is attractive. A person that walks in their assignment is fulfilled. If the Lord is my helper, I say with confidence, what can man do to me? There's a sense of purpose and mission and assignment that you walk with. Now, the eight-pointer coming out of the target. After assignment, you know what you get? You get something called relational priority. So many people that I know live with an absence of relational priority. Matter of fact, many people that I know look to get their identity from someone else, from another person. They put another person on the throne of their heart and say, please be God for me. You know what people do many times? They look for another person to complete them rather than compliment them. And you know God never made marriage for another person to complete us? Never, ever, 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 ever. Another human being should never be asked to complete us because only Jesus can complete us. He's the only one. There's no other source in the universe that can complete us other than God. But when we have self-centeredness, oh, honey, we have relational challenges. Relational priority is a direct benefit of being Christ-centered. What else do we have? Here's number seven. Ready for this? Economic stability. When Christ is the center, his word says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Where's Chad? What verse is that? Where's that, Chad? It's in Ephesians? Okay, your homework, look it up. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. When there is a Christ sinners about you, and hey, think about this for a moment. If you didn't have to worry about money ever again, what kind of person would you be? If you never had to think about it again, Wouldn't there be an effortlessness in how you would live your life? Of course there would. Now, here's the the, the six-pointer. Ready? Recreational balance. Recreational balance. Okay, we're going to go through this really quick on the other side. Number nine, the nine-pointer. Once we are self-centered, here's what we can expect. A spirit of self-preservation. Nobody else is going to look out for me. I'm looking out for myself. I've got a garden to defend. I can't be open and trusting because people have taught me they're going to break my heart. I'm going to be a bit cynical, a bit skeptical. I'm going to look at the world with a glass half empty because the world has showed me that when I put my hands out, I burn them on the stove. I'm not going to trust them anymore. I'm going to be a little bit guarded and build great big walls around me so no one could ever hurt me again. Sound familiar? You probably know someone like that. You probably have challenged that own spirit in your own heart because of an absence of centeredness. Here's the next reality. Here it comes. Hierarchical leader. They're in a constant state of chaos recovery. Otherwise, a.k.a. drama. Oh, do you know any drama queens? Have you listened to him talk on the phone? Have you heard him at the hair salon? Have you watched him in the grocery store? Have you heard him on the golf course, drama king? Have you heard him at the gun range, drama king? They're always, hey, listen, 
They're going from chaotic recovery, from chaotic recovery, from chaotic recovery. They keep cycling and cycling and cycling and circling and circling. Does that sound familiar? It ought to. It happened in the book of Exodus when the children of Israel would not come out from underneath their own self-centeredness to God-centeredness, so they kept making the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. You know what that's called? Hey, when I played sports, and if I did something stupid and wrong and errant, you know what my coach would tell me? Take a lap. Take a lap. I hated that phrase. Take a lap. I don't want to take any more laps. Well, then quit being a knucklehead. Okay. You know what? Someone that is a self-centered hierarchical leader, they're always going to be recovering from one chaotic thing from the next to another. And there will not be peace in their life. Here's the next one. Ready? This is, this is number seven. Relational How do you spell that? Hemorrhage. H-A-G-E. Relational hemorrhage. Relational hemorrhage. People that are, that are, that are a hierarchical, self-centered person, they're going to be living in relational hemorrhage. We understand hemorrhage, yes? yes? Perpetual bleeding. Bleeding out. Why? Because they've sought for a person to be God where God needs to be God, and they're not looking for God to be God, because why? God is not the center. And when a person is going to be prepared and committed and content to be a self-centered leader, the reality that's going to occur is relational hemorrhage. Now, here's the six-pointer. Here's how it plays out. Identity quest. If a person... Hey, go ahead and leave the, leave the camera there. Uh, leave the camera on that. On, on that, not on me. Leave it there. There are two types of centers in the universe, Christ-centered and self-centered. And if a person is going to be a self-centered leader, there is going to be a target that you're going to hit. You might not think you're shooting at it, but oh, dear one, this is the target, and this is how it's going to add up in the point value. Versus if you're a Christ-centered person, there are realities that are going to come from you that are going to be quite different from the things of the world, and the things of the world are not going to fulfill, but the things of the God of the universe, they certainly will. Someone say Amen. Those are the core characteristics. Now, here's what it promotes. Here's what it promotes. In John 9, 35, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Now, all of us are right now, listen to this. Listen to me very carefully. All of us presently right now are either being led or leading someone. That's everyone in the room, everyone watching at Silver Creek and Summit and Downey and, and Palm Desert. Every one of us, every one of us is either being led or leading someone. I'm not leading anybody. Oh, yes, you are. Sociologists tell us that the most introvert person influences 10,000 people in the course of her lifetime. The most introvert. You know any navel-gazing, quiet, looking down at their feet, collar around their ears, not bathing, showering, introvert person in the whole 10,000 people in the course of their lifetime is who they'll influence, and that ain't no one in here. You're either leading someone or you're following someone. You're either going to have these characteristics that are core or no. Now, here's what these two realities promote in a hierarchical Arthurian reality. If you're going to be a hierarchical leader, you're going to promote a spirit of entitlement, if you're going to be an Arthurian leader, you're going to promote a spirit of servanthood. Have you ever been around a person of, of a spirit of entitlement? Well, I deserve this. Why? Why do you deserve this? By the way, it's Philippians 4.19. Thanks, Chatty. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Philippians 4.19. Do you know what we're entitled to? Zero. Well, wait, can I just help you with a little 411? We're entitled to get nuked by God. If you want anything, if you think you, you're entitled to something, it's nuclear explosion from within. Because of our sin, we are in no way near entitled to anything. 
But if you're a self-centered, hierarchical thinker, you'll be like Gordon Gecko. There's an old movie called Wall Street. Michael Douglas was in it. And on, pardon? Is that right? He makes a statement where he says, greed is good. And he's discipling these young stockbrokers. You know what? That's exactly the, the way of the street. Because there's a spirit of entitlement. Do you know what? Do you know what? It, hey, next time. Now, I, I don't, I don't, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to disparage any other church because I love all the other churches. I think they're all doing a great job. But the next time you go to a church, look and see if you can see the, the pastor's parking spot painted on the parking lot in the front stall in front of the door. The very best, next, if you're ever curious, look around. Uh, the next time you ever go to some other church, just kind of get a sense of the climate if the pastor is elevated to almost a deity state. You are the holy reverend Dr. Roger Archer. We must come bow down and grovel at your feet because thou art the leaded shepherd of this wonderful church that we attend. Do you know where all the pastors on this staff park? In the farthest part of the bronze lot, all the way away. 900 yards from the front door. Why? Because we have no spirit of entitlement here. Do you know what we're entitled to do? Serve Jesus by serving you. Starting with me. And of the farthest parking stalls over there, I make sure I park the farthest away of all of our staff. So I'm walking the furthest. I don't wear it as a badge of honor. I wear it out of a sense of I'm not entitled to anything here. I'm entitled to serve Jesus by serving you. And our whole staff gets it. Every one of our staff gets it. Why? Because we lead with an Arthurian mindset. Now, uh, if you're a hierarchical leader, there's a spirit of territorialism. <laughs> Probably never experienced that in the marketplace, did you? That's my desk. That's my coffee mug. You can't stand there. That's my section of carpet. Hey, that's my section of air. Quit breathing that. Do you know what Arthurian promotes? No boundaries. Do you want to hear the craziest thing in the world? Um, we, we plant lots of churches all over the place. Sometimes we bump up against pastors that say, oh, I have a church in this city and you can't come here. I understand there's 400,000 people in your city and you got them all covered? And you're running about 450? Really? You got them all covered. We don't want you here. You know what's crazy? Fast food places have figured it out. Car dealers have certainly figured it out. Retail people have certainly... Could you imagine? There'd be no malls if there's territorialism. We don't want your store next to ours. We don't want your car lot next to ours. We don't want your fast food Taco Bell next to ours. You take your little chihuahua and get out of here. <laughs> Why is the church so lost in this area? Because of an Arthurian... Absence, a hierarchical presence, a Christ-centered absence, and a self-centered presence in the church, in the church leadership. And it's tragic, and it's sad. But that doesn't have to be us. No, it doesn't have to be us. In a hierarchical style, there's an intimidation. There's intimidation. Would they lead by, have you ever been around an intimidating leader? They just, they, they just, it's my way or the highway. I'm going to be louder and stronger, and I'm going to hold your paycheck as a carrot in front of you, and I'm going to intimidate you. Versus consensus. Versus consensus. An Arthurian leader, you know what they do? They, they write this verse down, Proverbs eleven fourteen. 14. I believe that's the verse. It talks about a, a lot of counselors make a lot of wisdom, make great choices. In a hierarchical leadership style, there's rigidity of thought. It's one person's way. In an Arthurian leadership style, there's flexibility of thought. There's feedback. Do you know what I love? I love it when I have an idea and I run with it and I throw it out there and someone else comes back and says, you know what, I have a better way of doing that, Raj. Let's think about that. And I, and I get to submit my idea to their idea. Do you know what that does for me? It thrills my soul. It doesn't make me insecure. It doesn't make me threatened. It because all that matters is that we got the right idea. It doesn't matter who came up with it. It matters that, that we got the right one. It's a Christ-centered Arthurian model. 
Now, here's what it results in. Here's what it results in. Both of these things are going to result in something. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, Don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Hey, God's not trying to strong arm you into poverty. It's God's pleasure to give you the kingdom. But it is, hey, write this down. It's predicated upon our centeredness. It's predicated upon our correct centeredness. It's predicated. It depends. It's contingent. It's contingent. You ever sell a house? And someone comes to you, I want to buy your house. Full price offer. Yay! But, my, but it's contingent upon the selling of my house. Oh. And you're just praying for someone else to sell their house. Not because you love them, because you don't want to live there anymore. It's contingent upon a correct centeredness. Now, here's what it results in, these two things. If you're a hierarchical leader, it's my kingdom thinking. If you're an Arthurian leader, it's the kingdom thinking. If you're a hierarchical leader, there's discord. Oh, there's discord. But if you're an Arthurian leader, you know what there is? There's unity. You know what, you know what I love about our church? I mean, I love a lot of things about our church, but you know what I love about our church? There's incredible unity here. This is a unity place. You know why? Because people don't get to gossip here. If you gossip here, this is not your church, and you'll be asked to leave. Because breaking someone down so you can be better is not going to let you be here. There, there, there's a way to, there's a mechanism to confront people here, including the pastor. I'm not threatened by confrontation. I want to be better, for heaven's sakes. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a jerk. If I'm being a jerk and you're intimidated to tell me because I've created a culture of a, of a hierarchical way of thinking, that's not any way to live, is it? Do we want to be in those kind of marriages? Do we want to be in those kind of dorm lives, in those, in those kind of school rooms with our classmates? Do we want to live underneath intimidation and insecurity and arrogance and all kinds of, of chaos and hemorrhage? And, uh, who would want to live that kind of life on purpose? <laughs> Nobody. That also results in a leader being fatigued. You know it's exhausting being a hierarchical leader? But there's leaders refreshed if you're an Arthurian leader. In a hierarchical way of thinking, there's a lot of turnover. In an Arthurian way, you know what? There's a lot of tenure. You know what's kind of cool? When I started writing the, um, the, uh, the handbook for the staff, you know, before there was no staff, I, here's what I said. You know what? People are going to get two weeks vacation. When they work here right off the bat, bat, whenever I hire my first person, they're getting two weeks. When they've worked here for three years, they're going to get three weeks. And when they work here for five years, they're going to get four weeks. You know why? Because I didn't think anybody would ever be here four weeks. <laughs> or four years. I didn't think they'd be here for four years. And now I got like half of my staff that's here over five years getting four weeks vacation. I'm going like, do you people ever work? You know why we don't have a lot of turnover? Because there's absolute peace. Absolute peace. People want to be here. They can make lots of other money doing other things, but they can't have what we have here, which is an environment of peace. And it, and it comes from an Arthurian leadership model. What Jesus said. Here's how it views people. Here's how it views people. These two styles. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, I really love this. From the moment you began praying, a command was given to you. And now I'm here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to God, Daniel. Say this out loud. I am, I am very, very precious, precious to, God. to God. Isn't that just refreshing for your spirit to hear? You're very precious to God. That's how God sees us. Now, you're going to love how these two different styles contrast. Here's the first one. If you're a hierarchical leader, you see people as tools. If you're an Arthurian leader, you see them as jewels. It's true. If, if it's all about someone else being beneath you, propping you up, all you see people as is a shovel or an axe or a hoe or a... Wait, wait, no, I shouldn't do that. I don't see you as a hoe. Oops. Tools and Jews, moving on. If, if you're a hierarchical leader, if you oh, help me, help me, Jesus. If you're a hierarchical leader, you see people as a means to an end. If, if you're an Arthurian leader, you see people as a means unto God. 
You know what? Here's the crazy thing. Call me crazy, but I don't think uh, that you're here to help me come into my promised land. I, I don't think you're here to co- help me come into my promised land. You know what I think? I think I'm here to help you come into your promised land. That's why I think I'm here. So you can find your promised land. Can you imagine if we all thought that way about each other? Hmm, sounds a lot like Jesus. How else does that view people? Well, the leader's promised land versus the personal promised land. The leader's promised land instead of the personal promised land. You know what's interesting about hierarchical leaders? They're acquirers. Arthurian leaders, they're assisters. Hierarchical leaders are acquirers, acquire, acquirers. They want to amass. Sorry, that's, that's uh, backwards. That's inverted. Flip, flip, flip up those. If you're a hierarchical leader, all you want to do is acquire. If you're an Arthurian leader, all you want to do is assist. You're the ultimate point guard. You're the distributor. You're the distributor. How else does it view people? Well, if you're a hierarchical leader, it views, you view people with indifference. If you're an Arthurian leader, you view them with tenderness. What's the phraseology? What's the phraseology? John 15, 15. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends since I have told you everything the Father has told me. Now, check this out. You're going to love this. If you are a hierarchical leader, People work for you. If you're an Arthurian leader, people work with you. Do you know what I never say? I never say, man, that Kimberly Barda, she, work, she works for me. That, that Chad Beach, he works for me. That, that Mark Wymore, he works for me. Well, no, they don't. They work for God. And they work with me. You see, the knights of the round table, everyone has a sword and say, and the buck stops with Arthur or Archer. Fill in the blank. (laughs) But they don't work for me. They work for God. But they work with me for God. And I sign their checks. Here's the other phraseology. Do they work under me or alongside me? Do they work under me? I have 50 guys under me. Wow. You're arrogant. (laughs) You're hierarchical. You're insecure. You know what? I have 50 guys working alongside me. Isn't that, isn't, doesn't that sound like Jesus? I have 50 people working alongside me. Can you imagine Jesus saying, yeah, I got these 12 disciples. They, They work under me. No, they don't. And he's God, and he didn't say that. He said, I call you friends. Hierarchical, Arthurian centeredness. Page 67. Christian contrast. Christian contrast. Now, in our theology, in our theology, we are going to... uh, we, we are going to be in one of two primary camps if we are, in fact, a Christian. Now, let's throw that, that graphic up there, Will, if you wouldn't mind. You have this uh, fill-in-the-blank in your book, yes? Here are the blanks I want you to write down. The C stands for Christian, the E stands for Evangelical, and the P stands for Pentecostal. The C is Christian, the E is Evangelical, and the P is Pentecostal. Now, what's the difference? (laughs) Really, you know what? Not much. But I think it's important for me to define for you the C first. I am a C. I am a C-H, I am a C-H-R-E-S-E-I-N. I have C-H-R-E-S-E in my A-T-A-R-T and I have L-I-V-E-T-E-R-N-L-Y. Christian, live eternally, good for you. Hey, uh, Will, let's skip down to the theological distinctives, can we? I want to talk to you about the Christian distinctive. 
Skip down, Will. Christian distinctive. Christian distinctive, okay? These eight, eight distinctives are written in your book, but I want to read through them really quickly because I want to give you scripture references. We're not going to look at them because there's just way too many, but I want you to have them. This is what tells you you're a Christian. Because some people said, I said, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, F and yeah, S-O-B-G-D. Yeah, I'm a Christian, man. Man, me and my old lady, we shack it up. We have 18 kids and all from 12 different families. But, man, we're a Christian. Oh, really? Wow, never would have known. Why do you think you're a Christian? I'm an American. <laughs> really? Wow. Are you going to hell? Come on, let me talk to you. Here's what makes you a Christian. Number one, you have to be able to answer yes to all eight of these uh, definitives. And if you can't answer yes to all of them, you are definitely, by definition, not a Christian. Okay, ready? Here we go. Number one, was Jesus Christ born of a virgin? Yes or no? Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus Christ, for 33 years, lived a sinless life and committed not one sin, yes or no? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He was crucified for the sins of the world, yes or no? Acts chapter 10, 39 through 41. Acts chapter 10, 39 through 41. He arose from the grave on the third day, yes or no? Luke 24, 13 through 49. I feel like a bingo caller. Luke 24, 13 through 49. Bingo! Number five, he spent 40 days on the earth post-resurrection. Luke 24, 50 through 30. Number six, Luke 50 through 53, sorry. Luke 24, 50 through 53. Sorry. Number six, he ascended to heaven. Yes or no? I got these all out of sequence. Doggone it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I miss one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm missing a verse. Um, okay, well, you're going to look it up for yourself. Uh, <laughs> he ascended to heaven. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, number seven is the way, is the way to get to God. John 14, 6. Jesus didn't say, I am a way, I am the way. Number eight is coming again. Yes or no? John 14, 2 through 3. Now, these are the Christian distinctives. Now, I want to go back uh, to the chart, uh, Will. Let's go back to the chart. And these are the blanks that I want you to fill in because we're going to come back to them. Under the evangelical side, under the evangelical side, Will, throw those, throw those graphs, throw those next graph. There we go. There's a blank I want you to fill in right underneath Christian. The arrow pointing down is Holy Spirit. Because the definitive distinction between the evangelicals and the Pentecostals is purely this one thing. Does the gifts of the Holy Spirit continue in the church today, or did the gifts of the Holy Spirit stop with the death of the last apostle? And this is a divisive argument that has shredded the church for centuries. Well, I'm not going to debate or argue with you. I'm just going to share with you what the distinctives are, and I'm going to let you come to your own conclusions. Uh, but first of all, I want to show you underneath the evangelical side, there is also a continuum of evangelicals, because not all evangelicals are the same. They are either ultra-conservative or animated conservative. There are the evangelicals that will... That will have to go to a traditional church, sit in the pews, sing from hymnals, only have an organ and a piano, and if the drums come in, that's the church that's going to hell in a handbag. And they're not going to have anything more than three hymns and a punt. That's going to hell in a handbag. 
And the sermon is going to be something that's going to be predictable. It's something you've heard before that you can read from and recite for yourself. And then that's a great form of worship. That's, that is an ultra-conservative evangelical. Now, an animated, an, an animated conservative would be someone that would raise their hands and like a little bit of electric guitar. They, they don't mind saying a little bit of amen or praise the Lord quietly under their breath. But they're not going to get carried away. Right? The, uh, <laughs> the other side of the continuum of the Pentecostal. There are two, two extremes of Pentecostalism. There are cl- what I call closet costals, <laughs> meaning they embrace all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they do it in a closet so no one thinks that they're a little bit weird. And then there are what I call the hypercostals. Those are the people that do not practice uh, movie theater etiquette. They will jump up at any time and do a Jericho march around the building. They will have hankies and tambourines, and they will stand up and start applauding and blocking someone's view, irrespective of where they are in the sermon or the message of the liturgy of the weekend. They will speak in tongues at any given moment. They will interpret wherever they don't want to or not wanted. They will give a prophetic word because they think that the Lord wants them to give their gift. Those are the hypercostals. And basically, when you size up the church across the face of the earth, it really boils down to evangelicals and Pentecostals, either very conservative evangelicals or animated evangelicals or closet costals or hypercostals. Follow me? Turn the page. This is going to get good. Okay, so what, pray tell, is the difference? What is the difference? Well, let's first of all start with the evangelical distinctive. The evangelical distinctive. Any evangelical will tell you that they embrace the Trinity theology. What is that? What is the Trinity theology? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God. I thought you just said God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I did. One God, three distinctive personalities and assignments. I don't understand that. Yes, you do. Think about nutrition. The incredible edible egg. Right? You have a yolk. You have a white. And you have a shell. You don't have eggs. You have an egg. Think about your basic chemistry in nature. If you take two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen and you freeze it, you have ice. If you take that same molecular structure and you boil it, you have steam. If you lift up your tap faucet and you drink it, you have water. You haven't changed the molecular structure. You've changed the shape. And all of them will have different perfunctory functions. Yes? Jesus manifests himself in nutrition and in physics and in chemistry. And he also manifests himself in the word. Right? God the Father His job is to create. God the Son, his job is to connect. God the Holy Spirit, his job is to empower. Now, write this verse down. Uh, John 16, 7, you see it there. or Yeah, you can circle it, right? Because every evangelical will tell you they believe in the Messiah fulfilled. Every, Every evangelical will tell you that they believe that the Messiah fulfilled John 16, 7. Well, what is John 16, 7? John 16, 7 says that... If I go away, I will send the comforter, the counselor. I will send the Holy Spirit to you. Now, the the Holy Spirit's job is very, very specific. Basically, to empower. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Write that verse down. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Why was it so cool what Jesus did? Here's why it was so cool. Because God only dwelt among us Before the crucifixion, after the resurrection, he dwelt within us. And any evangelical will tell you, I am Trinitarian in my theology. I believe Jesus ushered in the promise of John 16, 7. Verse 3, but they will declare that the Holy Spirit's gifts discontinued operation post last disciple's death. The basic evangelical premise is this. The working of the Holy Spirit was sent to establish the birth of the church. And when the last disciple died, the works of the Holy Spirit desisted. Now, write this verse down. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. 
Um, th this is a list of some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are pages of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but this verse kind of compacts a bunch of them. The gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, the gift of discerning of spirits, the gift of, of wisdom. All of these gifts, any evangelical will tell you, existed for the birth of the church, but when John died on the Isle of Patmos in 90 AD, a very old man in isolation, the last of them to die, that the gifts stopped. Well, write this verse down. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, here's where the Pentecostal distinctive comes in. The Pentecostal distinctive. By the way, the word Pentecostal is not new to the New Testament church. There's a festival of Pentecost that Moses instituted with the children of Israel as they're wandering through the desert. So the, the word Pentecost is a word that transcends both covenants, okay? Just so we're clear on that reality. Because some people would write a synonym, Pentecostal equals, Waco, spaghetti. No. Here's what a Pentecostal will embrace, the Trinitarian theology. They'll believe that Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled John 16, 17, and declares that the Holy Spirit's gifts continued operation post last apostle's death. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, um, the author tells us, as he's speaking about the gifts of the Spirit, that these gifts are for you and for your children and for descendants that will come and follow. So it's, it's hard for me to get my arms around the reality that God would say, I'm casting this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to the church for the birth, and then but not for the rest of y'all. Especially because Acts 2.39 tells us that this gift is for the operation. Now you can obviously tell where I lean. I am a Pentecostal Christian believer. So, am I a closet costal or am I a hypercostal? <laughs> I'm not. A, you've never seen me jump around doing a Jericho march and just blabber out. You've never seen me do that. But I want to. <laughs> You know me. Okay. Uh, hyper, costal, or no, other way around. Closet, costal, hyper, costal, um, conservative. Ultra conservative, <laughs> yeah, an animated conservative. Okay, here's where Roger is. Here's where God has asked this church to operate J K L M N O P. We are a moderate Pentecostal Christian church. Now, why is that so important? It's important because there will be, the next line, an experiential distinctive that you're going to experience in how you lead and worship in your church. There's going to be an evangelical contrast continuum, and there's going to be a Pentecostal continuum contrast. These are going to be the two realities that are going to drive how you read your Bible, how you lead your groups, how you live in the context of your workplace, how you live in the context of relationships, how you exercise a common uh, small group interaction. It's going to drive how you read your Bible. It's going to influence how you live your life. Now, why is this so important? Because there's also going to be a personal distinctive, a personal distinctive. A personal distinctive. What does that impact? The different ways you do chicken. The different ways you do chicken. Now, what does, Roger, what does that mean? Well, here's what that means. 367,000 evangelical churches in America, right? And all of them do chicken differently. But if they espouse those eight non-negotiable realities, what are they? Christian, you're a Christian. If those eight tenets are in operation in your life, you are a Christian. But, for example, if, um, 
What if Charles? If Charles says, Roger, uh, I, I want to invite you over to my house for, for chicken. I'm like, oh, sweet. You know why? I love chicken. Well, do you know what I have in my mind? I know how chicken is done. Drumettes, marinated in soy sauce, 375, baked in the oven for 45 minutes, pulled out, served over rice with a hot chili sauce that you squeeze on the side and a little bit of teriyaki sauce that you can splash in as well, and that's chicken in my mind. I get to, are you, is your mouth watering right now? I, I get to Charles' house, and I see a crock pot on the counter. I'm going, what the heck? What, what are you doing? He goes, we're having chicken. Where's the chicken? I don't smell soy. I don't smell teriyaki. Where's the chicken? The oven's not even on. No, because we like it with cream and mushroom soup, all ground up, served in with a little uh, basil, and we have a broth base that we put it in, and we serve it up in a bowl. <laughs> Friend, I know chicken, and that ain't no chicken! Right? Everybody just does chicken based on how they do chicken. And guess what we know? We know how we do chicken. We have a 70-minute service. We're always teaching from the Bible. We have four worship songs. We're going to have time for ministry. We're going to have time for people to be prayed for. And we're going to have a ripping, irreverent, great, fun, loud time doing it. <laughs> Not too loud. We don't want to offend the neighbors. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now, everybody who likes how we do chicken, they come and do chicken with us. Small groups, small groups are important. It's important we have people that are, that are seasoned in life. We don't want a church of just like, just teenagers. We want some gray hairs and no hairs. That's important. We want to have children, not on drugs and on the street, but in our church. We want to have not just white people. Come on. Mo color, mo fine. We don't want to have just a, a, a stuffy church just full of rich people. We want some people in need to blend it in, to make it like a, a, a true eclectic family. It's how this church does chicken. We don't want church to be all about four walls. We want to be out in the taking it to the street. We want to be out in the streets. Right? See, if you identify with that, then you love how we do chicken. We are a Christian, Pentecostal, moderate expression, and that influences how we do chicken. But here's the question, really, ultimately, you have to ask. How do you do chicken? How do you do chicken? This is all based upon your centeredness. Are you Christ-centered? Are you self-centered? Do you have an Arthurian philosophy, or do you have a hierarchical philosophy? Are, 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 are you clear with what it is that you're doing on purpose? Because let me trust, tell you this for sure. If you're not doing it on purpose, the gaps will be filled in by something. And quite often, it's just chaos. It's why I've taken the time to write this down, to present it to you, so you may know how to approach the God who seeks you out. And that's a good word.